here. As Al said, I've come from Ipswich today, uh, a little bit about uh, our church. Um, we have been on quite a journey um, in recent years as a church. We've moved into an old cinema in the center of our town um, about two years ago, and um, God is doing extraordinary things amongst us. We re- he really just so grateful for what he's uh, doing amongst us. We've now got to a point where we've outgrown the cinema that we're in. And um, in February, we're going to be moving to two services. God's just adding many to our, our church family there. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing lots of people baptized, which is really encouraging. A couple of weeks ago, we, we baptized five Iranians, uh, which was wonderful. People who have been amongst us for a year or so now, and um, there's many more Iranians amongst us, actually. Um, but five people that we can be really sure and clear that they have uh, received Jesus uh, as their Savior. And uh, it was such a, a beautiful and moving thing to hear their stories of how God has, um, how God's broken into their lives really from a nation where it would be really very much a very dangerous thing to profess faith in Christ. Um, God has moved in their lives and it's now brought them to Ipswich of all places. So uh, it's just so wonderful what God's doing. Um, just as, as Al said a little while ago, we're part of a family of churches called Relational Mission, which is about 50 or so churches plus 15 or 20 church plants, um, mostly based in Europe, but also some into Asia as well. And we've got a global vision. Um, But we're also part of a family of families called New Frontiers. And um, last week, I was in Cyprus for three days. Uh, There's worse places in the world to be. Um, I was in Cyprus for three days at a a gathering of leaders from across the globe, Um, people working into every single continent where there are people. Um, And New Frontiers, a family of families, really, we now have thousands of churches um, in about 90 different nations. And it was so encouraging to hear stories of what God is doing uh, beyond the UK. And we're encouraged what God is up to here in this country, but um, to hear of hundreds of churches planted in the last couple of years uh, in places like India and Kenya, uh, just the, the gospel is accelerating in these places in wonderful ways and signs and wonders, <coughs> miracles happening, um, as well as great persecution, as well as people experiencing um, imprisonment, um, death in some cases, some of our churches knowing um, brutal persecution. Um, but God is up to great things. And we were meeting people from Armenia, where there's obviously been great problems recently. And again, the gospel advancing. We heard from a guy who uh, has planted many churches in Ukraine, um, but has now since had to flee to the UK. And his church has been totally dispersed across loads of different nations. But wherever they have gone, they've planted churches. And so there's now churches being planted in other nations of Europe as a result of these passionate, zealous people who have lost everything. They've lost their homes. They've lost uh, their church building. They'd been through a building project in in their part of Ukraine where they were. They'd built a school. The the guy who we heard from, his wife, had uh, built this big school. It had all been completely demolished. And yet they're rejoicing because God is still working through them and the gospel of Jesus is going out across the world. I found that really encouraging. I found that really strengthening and I thought it might be just helpful for you to hear that. We are part of a great family of churches in relational mission, but we're also part of something bigger. And even New Frontiers is part of what God is doing. He's doing it in many different streams and families. He's up to great things across the globe. Uh, We're part of a a kingdom that is ever advancing. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, it's great to be here. Um, As well as leading the team at Hope Church, I also lead an event for our relational mission family of churches uh, called Sent, and it's for students and 20s. And I just want to just ask you, if you could raise your hand if you're between the age of 18 and 32. Just wait, just, yes, quite a few of you. Um, I want to invite you guys to come along to an event that we're doing in Ipswich, so just half an hour down the road from here, uh, on January the 5th and 6th, which is just for you. It's for you if you're in that age bracket. Um, right at the beginning of 2014, uh, 2014, 2024, uh, we are going to be worshipping and we're going to be praising God together. We're going to be praying uh, for the year ahead. We're going to be hearing great teaching. It's an event called Sent. Uh, you can book in at our website, which is sentgeneration.com, and it's really, really cheap. It's like 20 pounds right, right now, and um, we'd love for you guys to come along. It'll be just towards the end of your Christmas holidays, um, so please do join us for that. We'd love to see loads from Colchester there joining with our other churches as well. Okay, well, today we're concluding um, the series that you've been working through as a church uh, on the Trinity, and unsurprisingly, this series is in three parts, 
and we're coming to the third and final part of that series today. Uh, I want to uh, help you to understand this. What you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Not your experience, uh, not your background, not your resources, not your exam results. The most important thing about you is what you think about God. You are a theologian. You didn't know that, did you? You didn't know that you could put that on your CV. You are a theologian. Whether you have wrong thoughts or right thoughts about God, you have thoughts about God. You have thoughts about what he is like and uh, what his nature is, what he's passionate about. You've got ideas about God. Even if you are an atheist here, you've got ideas about the God that you don't believe in. You've got ideas about what you think he, she, or it is like. Let me tell you, you are a theologian. You have ideas about God, and they may be wrong and they may be right, but they actually shape your life in ways that you maybe don't think about. And actually, this, therefore, is the most practical of series that you could possibly do, because actually, the way we think about God, what we think about him, shapes all the other areas of our life. You might be hoping, oh, I wish we did a series on how to handle money or how to be a better friend or how to be a better husband or father or whatever it might be. But actually, this series and coming to, to, to get to grips with who God is and what he's like is so practical because it's actually as we understand what God is like that actually our whole lives are shaped. And today, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit. You've been looking at God as revealed in the Bible, one God and three persons. He's revealed as Father. That's what you covered in week one. He's revealed as the Son, uh, most beautifully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's revealed as the Holy Spirit. And the Gospel of John, uh, the book of John in the New Testament, is where we're going to be based most of the time. Uh, John is one of the, uh, the writers of the, the four different Gospels or the four different biographies of Jesus that we find in the New Testament, the second part of the Bible. And uh, unlike the other biographies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John is, is uh, he's quite a deep thinker. He's not just content to report the facts as, as they happened. He's not just kind of doing a sort of a, a newsreel report or an eyewitness report of what happened. He actually wants us to uh, see behind the scenes a little bit as to what Jesus had revealed to him. And, and it's John that... Um, was probably closest to Jesus. Out of all of Jesus' disciples, he was the one, uh, he describes himself as the one that Jesus loved. I mean, I would do that if I was one of the disciples. I'd say, I'm the one that Jesus really loved. But John did get in close. He's at all of the key moments of Jesus' life. He and another guy called Peter, another guy called James, they kind of get in on all of the kind of uh, secret moments that none of the other disciples and followers get in on. So he gets great insights. And he doesn't miss out on the important stuff. And he records some things for us that are really, really important. He gives us an insight right at the beginning of his gospel into what God is like. He shows us, he shows us that God is one, of yes, but he shows us that there are distinct persons within the Godhead. This is such a key thing for us to get our heads around. Let's just read the first verse of the book of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you fast forward to verse 14, we are told who this Word was. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's showing us that Jesus was and is himself personally divine. Jesus is God, and he has been with God for eternity. So we already see here that there is one God, and yet there are distinct persons within who God is. That's quite a big deal. It's a big deal for us, but it gets even More glorious because when we get to John chapter 14, you might want to flick forward there, John actually reveals to us that God is not two distinct persons, but he's three. John chapter 14 is uh, describing what happens when Jesus gathers his disciples for a meal before he's going to go to the cross and die a death in agony and apparent uh, defeat, but it's actually for the sins of the world that he would die. 
He's having a meal with his, his disciples. He's washing their feet. If you had one day left to live, what would you do with it? Would you wash the stinky feet of those around you? And they have a meal together. They have bread and they have wine together. And Jesus drops a bombshell on them. Like what he says to them in John chapter 13 and verse 33 is the, the greatest bombshell that's ever been dropped on anyone in the history of the world. I don't know what you could perceive to be the worst news you could receive today. This is worse. Okay, I need you to understand this because the disciples, they uh, have walked with Jesus for about three years. They've gone wherever he has gone. They've seen him do incredible miracles. They've received incredible wisdom and teaching from him. Their experience of Christianity is Jesus, just walking with him every day, opening their eyes in the morning, oh, and there's Jesus, just sleeping over there. Getting up, where are we going to go today, Jesus? That's their experience of Christianity. It's not some services, it's not going to a life group, it's I hang out with Jesus all the time. That's Christianity. And Jesus says this to them, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Just imagine that for a moment. You've walked with Jesus for three years. He's everything to you. You've given up everything to follow him. All you want to do is be with him. There's nothing better. There's no other thrill in life that you're longing for. I just want to be with Jesus, wherever he goes. And then he says, I'm only going to be with you a little while longer. And where I'm going, you cannot come. Imagine the... The pain, imagine the horror, imagine the, the, the sense of dread in their hearts. That, that hit them. It hit them. And then we see in John chapter 14, and verses 15 to 20, Jesus makes them a promise. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. What a great bit of news to hear for the disciples. We won't be left on our own. will not leave you as orphans. I've lost my place. This is not what Jesus said. This is what I said. <laughs> The spirit of truth. I will, leave you, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So I will come to you. So he's talking about the, the, the one that the Father will send. He says, I will come to you. So it's, it's the same thing for them. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This is of immense comfort to the disciples because they're now hearing we're not going to be left on our own. Jesus is going to come to us. But how is he going to come to them? He's going to come to them through the presence of this advocate that will be with them and be in them. And we learn, as we just read on a little bit later, the name of this one that will come in verse 26. He says, The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. If you're ever asked, uh, where does the Bible talk about the Trinity? Well, firstly, you can say it's everywhere. For those who, who actually have eyes to see, it's everywhere. But here's a verse, because we see here, the Father will send the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. We see it at Jesus' baptism, when the Spirit... De- he descends upon Jesus and the Father speaks from heaven. This is my son who I love and with whom I'm well pleased. We see it when Jesus uh, sends his disciples out to, on mission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When we, go, when we look through this, the Trinity is everywhere. I've been working through this with a friend recently who's uh, come from a a tradition, a church tradition, where actually the the, the Trinity is denied. And really, that's a heretical thing, actually. It's not in line with what the Bible teaches. And as we've looked at this together, his eyes have been opened. Wow, this is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is God. 
The Father is God. Jesus is God. So we'll just look at a few things about the Holy Spirit this morning in the time we have remaining. Just some uh, simple things I hope will help us as we go forward. The first thing is this. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is not an impersonal force. He is a person. He's called here a helper or an advocate, a comforter, a counsellor. It might be that in your version of the Bible. An encourager, a strengthener. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an it. Christians can sometimes be ignorant of the Holy Spirit. Not because of um, any, anything willful necessarily, but sometimes we can grow up in traditions where there's fear of what, what might it look like if we ask the Holy Spirit to be amongst us. And sometimes people can see things and they can see experiences that are attributed to the power of the Holy Spirit and think, I don't want that in my church. And people can kind of be a little bit kind of um, cautious about talk of the Holy Spirit. It might even be nothing that they've seen, but they've just heard other people say, don't go there. And they've not actually gone there. And so sometimes we can kind of think, well, yeah, the Holy Spirit is kind of like that, that weird uncle that we don't really talk about in our family. You know, just kind of, we know his name, but we don't know anything more about him. But actually the Holy Spirit is a person who we can know. Many of us can be in a bit of a, uh, kind of a place of a, Fogginess when it comes to who the Holy Spirit is. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's where you've come from. Maybe that's your experience. He's a person to be known and to be pursued and not to be sidelined. This is the case in some churches. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, though, who is God. To sideline him from a place of fear or a place of trying to control things, trying to have things neat and tidy, is not good. It's not right. And, and he's a person, and as with any uh, person, he's a person we can know and talk to. I think as Hugh shared uh, in the first message in this series, um, the normal pattern of prayer in the Christian life is to God, our Father. That's how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is um, what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. So uh, normally our prayers, friends, are to our Father. This is it's so important we grasp that God is our Father. He loves us. He's for us. He wants us to come to him. We're not a nuisance to him. We're not an interruption on his precious me time. We are his children. But we also see prayers in the scripture of directly to Jesus. When Stephen, um, the, uh, the, the, the church leader in Acts, we see uh, he, he's stoned to death and he prays to Jesus. Jesus, receive my spirit. We see right at the end of, Reve of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the spirit and the bride, the church, say, come, Lord Jesus. So we can pray to Jesus. We don't see any instances that we, I can recall right now or that I can see in the scripture of prayer directly to the Holy Spirit. But I don't think it's wrong to say, Holy Spirit, would you come and help me? I don't think that's wrong to do that. But our, our, our primary uh, prayers are, are primarily rather to our Father. He's not an abstract power. That's what some um, false... Uh, religions teach. Jehovah's Witnesses would teach that the Holy Spirit is, is some kind of abstract force. Other religions teach that also. But he's a person. Secondly, the Holy Spirit gives us life. If we take a moment to uh, just think about it, none of us, none of us in the natural would seek after knowing God. That like all of us have this kind of nature within us that is the Bible calls the flesh, our kind of old sort of natural self. And what we want more than anything else in our flesh is just to kind of go after the pleasures of this world, of riches, of sex, of other kinds of pleasure, of uh, lots and lots of food. Well, that's kind of what our, like the natural part of us, our old natural self, which we still know of a little bit in our lives, that's what we want. But it's actually a work of the Holy Spirit that leads us to want Jesus. The Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. That's what it says in the book of Ephesians. We weren't just naughty people who needed to be trained how to be good again. We were spiritually dead. We were dead, unable to know true life in God. And it's the Holy Spirit who comes and breathes life into us. 
This is the language that Jesus uses in John chapter 3. This guy called Nicodemus comes to him in the middle of the night. And uh, Nicodemus is a kind of respectable religious leader. And he comes to Jesus because he doesn't want to be seen kind of with this rabbi who's causing a bit of a stir. And he says, Jesus, what, what, do I, what do I need to know? And Jesus kind of interrupts his questioning even before Nicodemus can get his questions out. And we see in John chapter 3, let's go there now if you have a Bible. <clears throat> Jesus says this in verses 3 to 8. He says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. What a stupid question that is, hey? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit plays a vital role in bringing people into new life in Jesus. We were spiritually dead. If any of you have ever been resuscitated... I won't ask you to raise your hand here if you have been, but if you've ever been resuscitated, you didn't come around and think, I, I did a really good job at receiving that life. I did a really good job at receiving those pumps on my heart. I was just posturing myself so well. No, 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 it was, it was a work of the person doing the resuscitating. You had nothing to contribute except for your deadness. And what we see here is that the Holy Spirit is the one who, he's the one who brings life. So I want that to encourage you, friends. Because there's not degrees of deadness. You're either dead or you're not dead. And so you might be thinking about friends or family members who they just seem really, really far off. They seem so anti knowing Jesus. And they're no more further off than anyone else, actually. There's not a degree of far awayness. <laughs> it's, it's the Holy Spirit who will ultimately bring life. So let that encourage you. We want to pray for them, we want to share the good news with them, because as the good news of Jesus is proclaimed, and as it's heard by people, the Holy Spirit, he comes in to spiritually dead hearts to make them live as they place their faith in Jesus and all he's done. So it's the Holy Spirit who gives life. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit within us enables us to enjoy friendship with God. If the Holy Spirit was not God, then we, we couldn't enjoy friendship with God like we do. The Holy Spirit is not, he's not like some divine milkman who kind of comes and drops life on our doorstep and then, then moves on. No, he comes to dwell within us and remains within us. I think Hugh has recommended this book to you. It's called The Good God by Michael Reeves. And um, this is a fantastic book all about the Trinity. I would highly recommend that all of you get a hold of it. It's a thin book, so you feel really clever after reading it. You feel like I've finished the whole book. And, uh, and Michael Reeves says this, If God was in heaven and his spirit just a mere force, he would be more distant than the moon. But because he is God himself, and because he has come to dwell within us, he is closer than anyone else could ever be to us. Just think about that for a moment. Who's the person who is closest to you? Is it your mum, your dad, your spouse, your child? Who's closest to you? If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within you. And therefore, God is closer than anyone else could ever be. And he remains within us so that our friendship with God will blossom and grow. You know, you, you can know God as deeply as you want to know him. <laughs> you, you're never, you're never going to get to the bottom of, of God. You're never going to kind of reach the end and think, I know there, all there is to know now. You can know him more. You can know him deeper. There's more of him to know. If you want him, you can. You can know him more and more. Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes that God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So the Holy Spirit enlightens us to the love of God. 
It's the Holy Spirit within us who speaks to our hearts of the love of God. It's the Holy Spirit within us who reminds us that we are God's children. Do you ever have a moment where, maybe you did even as we've praised God today, where kind of like your spirit bubbles up within you. You think, I'm loved by God. He doesn't just put up with me. He's not just kind of accepting me because he's kind of taken me on and now he can't get rid of me. No, no, he, he really loves me. I'm his child. Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit bubbling up within you. He comes to remind us that we are children of God. And we're not just a project. No, no, God has taken us on and has committed to love us, to love us as God the Father loves the Son. This is how we are loved. And this produces joy within us. He reminds us, you've been adopted. This gives us ongoing life. It gives us ongoing joy. It gives us joy that spills out into our lives. Not just to start with God, but his presence within us draws us ever further into relationship with God. He stirs us to think more and more about Jesus and the things of Jesus. You see, the natural self, the old self within us that we still know a bit of in our lives is naturally self-centered. It's naturally self-oriented. We just want stuff that's going to kind of make the focus on us. We just want stuff that is going to kind of make us um, more and more kind of flabby, really. But actually, the Holy Spirit, he he loves and has always loved God the Father. He's always loved God the Son. And therefore, his activity within us makes us Jesus-centered, Jesus-orientated. And it's a bit-by-bit journey, friends. And sometimes we can think, it's taking a long time because I'm still so self-obsessed. I'm still so self-orientated. But actually, the Holy Spirit wants to uh, make us more and more Jesus-centered, Jesus-oriented. And it's his activity in our lives that does that. And we need to say, Holy Spirit, increase that. Would you make me more and more Jesus-centered? Fourthly, the Holy Spirit in us testifies to others. God wants everyone to know him. God wants everyone to know him. He wants you, if you don't know him, if you're here today and you're just checking out church, maybe someone's invited you along, maybe you just somehow came across this church online, um, he wants you to know him. He really wants you to know him. He wants your mum, your dad to know him. He wants your friends to know him. He wants your colleagues to know him. He wants your enemies to know him. He wants Hamas to know him. He wants wants you to know him. He wants everyone to come to know him as his father. He's a big-hearted God. He won't force people, but he wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Hugh unpacked this a couple of weeks ago. Why did God create the world? Why is there something rather than nothing? That's a huge question to ask. And if you are an atheist, that's a big question to ask. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why did God do it? Well, the shape of God shows us. He's always been a loving community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wasn't bored or lonely because he's always been in community. It wasn't that he just really wanted to have something to rule and boss around. He created out of a place of the overflow of his love. God the Father, this fountain of love. And it's from a place of this love overflowing that God created. He didn't become love one day. It's really important that we understand that when the Bible says God is love, he can only be love because he is three persons. Often I speak with those that might knock on my door, who are Jehovah's Witnesses or others, and ask the question, do you believe God is love? And if you do not believe that God is three persons, he cannot be love. Because once upon a time, he was on his own. Once upon a time, there was no one to love. And so therefore, he cannot have been love at that time. And he became love when he created some things. No, no, but God is love. The Bible makes it clear. He has eternally existed as three persons, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's from that place of love flowing out that he created, and he's on this mission where he wants all of his creation to experience his love, to know him 
as God and as Father. And God allows us and he draws us in, friends, to share in this mission in the world. He draws us in that we're not sat on the bench. It's not like, hey, well, welcome. Now you can come and sit over here. No, he draws us into the mission. And he's given us the power by the Holy Spirit to be on mission for him. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is probably the key verse to understanding the rest of Acts. In fact, it's probably the key verse to understanding the world today. This is what Jesus said to his disciples just before he ascent, he's, he's gone to the cross, he's died on the cross, on the third day he's risen, and then he spent some time with his disciples, and then he gathers them together and he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the key verse to understanding the rest of the book of Acts and how uh, Jesus' people go on mission to share God's love with anyone who will listen because they're suddenly transformed when the Holy Spirit comes upon them from fearful people to courageous people. But it's also the key to understanding the world in which we live today where millions, hundreds of millions of people profess faith in Jesus and where whole nations have been shaped and changed by the message of Christianity, this nation included. This nation would look nothing like it does if it wasn't for the incredibly rich Christian heritage that we have as a nation. And it can all be traced back to this verse here, where Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. This is such a key thing. It's really key to understanding the world today because in the Old Testament, um, there were times and places where the Holy Spirit was poured out upon special people for special tasks, where God's uh, anointed ones were asked to do something special, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. You can read about people uh, in the Old Testament for whom that happened to. But then the prophet Joel says, there's going to come a day, God's speaking through Joel, where I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on, on, on your sons and daughters, on your old men and your young men, that there will be a time when God's people will receive power. They will receive the Holy Spirit upon them. The Spirit would be poured out upon God's people because Jesus had accomplished the task for which God sent him to do. He'd gone to back to his Father and then the Holy Spirit had been poured out. And we see such a transformation. Take Peter, for example. There was a moment just before Jesus' crucifixion where he's frightened of a teenage girl who's questioning him. He, he, he's at the point where he's swearing and cursing and saying, I don't even know who you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. He doesn't want anyone to see that he's associated with Jesus. And then just a few weeks later, having received the Holy Spirit, he's preaching to thousands of people. And thousands of people give their lives to Jesus and get baptized. There's a transformation, friends. And then he goes on with his mates and they see healings and they see uh, other incredible things happening. All because of the Holy Spirit's power. You see, the Holy Spirit, he, yes, comes to uh, dwell within us at the time when we uh, place our faith in Jesus, when we first hear of this good news and put our uh, faith in Jesus. He comes to dwell within us, to live within us. But there is a, a pouring out of the Spirit that we are to know. And sometimes it happens right at that first moment, uh, early in our Christian walk. And sometimes it happens a little bit later. But there's a, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, a being, a being plunged in God's power that we get to know. You can read it right through the book of Acts, where people who are clearly Christians already, and then some while later, God pours out the Holy Spirit upon them in great measure, and that they are empowered for the mission. And we see that the Holy Spirit helps God's people to be witnesses in words, in works, and in wonders. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12 to his disciples, Luke chapter 12 verse 11, When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. Verse 12, For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Who feels like sometimes you just absolutely kind of, you just make a, a mess of trying to share your faith with people? Anyone? 
Yeah, a few of us. You think, I, should, I didn't say that. I should have said that. I, just, I wish I had said it differently. I wish I'd asked that. Listen, we can say, Holy Spirit, give me the words. We can take the promises of God back to him in prayer. You know, we're invited to do that. God, you've said it. So Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So next time we're going out with our friends or watching sports, our children play sports or whatever, we can say, Holy Spirit, would you give me the words that I need? Would you teach me what to say? We can, we can ask him. He, he, wants, he wants to empower us to share the good news of Jesus with people. He wants to make us bold. He wants to make us courageous. That's what happened to the disciples when they were, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Suddenly they were courageous. People thought they were drunk. You know, sometimes drunk people are kind of bold, aren't they? In a, not such a good way. But the Holy Spirit wants to, to, to so make us courageous that we don't fear what people might think of us. Our inhibitions kind of go. We're not so worried about people's opinion. He wants to testify through our works, through the way in which we are like Jesus. He wants to make us more and more like Jesus. So in the settings we are in, we actually point people to Jesus as we serve people like Jesus served people. As we uh, care for people, as we love people, as we, um, as we kind of uh, humble ourselves and make it not about us, but actually to serve others, the Holy Spirit wants to empower us for this kind of life. We see in, in uh, Galatians chapter 5, where, where Paul writes, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So if the, if the flesh is kind of like self-centered and wanting stuff for ourselves, then actually as we walk by the Spirit, as we kind of live in this way of saying, Holy Spirit, guide me, uh, work through me, we actually won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. But actually we will um, start to live a life that Jesus lived. Kind of walk in step with the Spirit. This is a key thing. It's not like we've got to just try really, really hard to do good things. No, no. We need the Holy Spirit working through us. We need to experience his power. We need to ask him for fresh uh, filling. Mm -hmm. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, writes in Ephesians, um, he says, um, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, he says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and that... that uh, in the original language in which Paul was writing in Greek, it could be more accurately translated, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. It kind of literally says, be being filled. That's what it says in the Greek. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we can say, Father, I need, a f I need fresh filling. I need you to come and fill me. There was a, a guy called John Flavel who lived a few hundred years ago, and uh, he was known as or has been since known as one of the Puritans and they kind of get a bit of a bad rep because they try to ban Christmas you know that's not great hey we love Christmas um, but they were actually pretty they were serious about God they took him seriously they want to get rid of all kinds of idolatry in their lives John Flavel said this we were not meant to live without spiritual exhilaration maybe you've been taught otherwise maybe you've been taught you know what, it's all about gritting your teeth and just pushing on through until you die. But actually, John Flavel says, we were not meant to live without spiritual exhilaration. And the Christian who goes for a long time without the experience of heart warming will soon find himself tempted to have his emotions satisfied from earthly things and not as he ought from the Spirit of God. Did you follow that? If we, if we go through this life just kind of dry, not receiving from the Holy Spirit afresh, we soon find ourselves tempted to find our satisfaction in other things. He goes on to say this, The soul is so constituted that it craves fulfillment from things outside itself. Our soul craves fulfillment and will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach spiritual ones. The believer 
Listen to this. The believer is in spiritual danger if he allows himself to go for any length of time without tasting the love of Christ and savoring the felt comforts of a Savior's presence. You know, as we gather like we do, and as we spend time with God in, our, in, our, in the secret place, we want to taste the love of Christ, savor his, the comfort of his presence. When Christ ceases to fill the heart with satisfaction, our souls will go in silent search of other lovers. Maybe you've known that to be true this week. Your soul's kind of gone looking for other lovers, as it were. Other things that you thought that would satisfy, and it's left you just feeling rotten. By the enjoyment of the love of Christ, John Flabel says, by the enjoyment of the love of Christ in the heart of a believer, we mean an experience of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given to us. So this is kind of ongoing walk with the Holy Spirit, tasting the love of Christ, the presence of God. Our hearts need to be warmed. If they're not, we're in danger. We'll go after other things. There's going to be a moment, just a minute, just to kind of, if you know that's you, there's a moment just to bring this to God. He's not got his arms folded thinking, oh, about time you came back. No, he wants to help you. He wants to minister to you. He wants to clean you, forgive you. Go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. You will look different. You will not gratify the desires of your, your, your old fleshly nature. You're in your works, the way you live your life, you will look different. Finally, the Holy Spirit will testify through wonders. Jesus told his disciples that they should expect supernatural things to accompany them. Miracles, signs and wonders would accompany Jesus' people. Just as they had when Jesus walked on this earth, just as they had seen for those three years, Jesus is saying, this is going to continue, guys. It's not just going to suddenly stop because the Bible is going to be brought together, as some Christians would teach. No, this is going to continue. In John chapter 14, let's go there now. This is that same kind of passage where he's been teaching them about the Holy Spirit. He says this, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Talking about asking him for great signs and wonders and miracles. He says in verse 12, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. So think about what Jesus did. There were days when all he did was just heal people all day. There were people who were oppressed by evil spirits and they were freed with one word. There was amazing miracles of provision. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, because I'm going to the Father, which means because I'm going to be ascending to go return to be at my Father's side, we're going to pour out the Holy Spirit. It's the, this is kind of the shorthand for it. Again and again and again, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. We're going to pour the Holy Spirit out upon you. That's why we could expect miracles for today. We can expect wonders for today because the Holy Spirit is at work amongst us. These things have not ceased, friends. I've heard stories this week around the world of great miracles, God at work. We may not see them as much as we'd like here in the West. I don't understand the dynamics. We certainly, in some ways, we're we're less spiritual than we were in this nation, but in some ways we're not. In some ways, there's, a, there's more of an understanding or, or more of a desire for spiritual things, I should say. We must ask God. Oh, God, would you pour out your Holy Spirit that we might see signs and wonders, just like you did in the Scriptures, just like you're doing in other parts of the world. Jesus never tells his followers off for expecting too much. Let's be those expect great things of God, shall we? There's more to come. I'm going to finish uh, with this quote from Charles Spurgeon. Then we're going, to, we're going to pray in the time we have remaining. Charles Spurgeon, a guy who lived a couple of hundred years ago, a great preacher in this country. He said, if you and I try, either as a church or as individuals, 
to do without the Holy Spirit, God will soon do without us. <laughs> he doesn't mince his words, this guy. Unless we reverently worship him and believingly trust in him, we shall find that we shall be like Samson when his hair was cut. Maybe you know that story. Samson in the Old Testament had this incredible strength. But when his hair was cut, his strength left him. Samson shook himself as he had done before, but when the Philistines were upon him, he could do nothing against them. Our prayer must always be, Holy Spirit, dwell within me. Holy Spirit, empower your servants. We know that we are utterly dependent upon him. Can we be that church, Redeemer? Can we be that church that says, I'm, I'm just utterly dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to go into my workplace. I want to go into time with my family. I want to go into my sports clubs. I want to go in saying, Holy Spirit, I need you. Father, pour your Holy Spirit out upon me. May I know greater and greater measure of your power in my life to do the things that you did, to say the words that you want me to say. Just um, as we come to, to, to finish, I'd love to pray for us, but I want us to do some praying too. You don't, you don't need me to pray for you. As we've already celebrated this morning, the curtain is torn in two. We can talk to God directly. We can come to him. But I just want to encourage you, no one is now told to wait, like Jesus told his disciples to wait until the Holy Spirit came upon them. There was a reason for that. There is that, no longer that reason. We don't need to wait and think, well, when I reach a certain level of being a Christian, when I can memorize all of the books of the Bible, <laughs> or when I've got rid of this particular thing in my life, then I will be ready to receive the outpouring or the baptism of the Holy Spirit for power, for, for mission. No one's told to wait now. Jesus has gone to the Father and and listen, God is so willing to pour out the Holy Spirit upon your life in great measure. He's so willing. Yeah. And for some, there might even be a, 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 a sign that accompanies that. We see that through our acts, that people spoke in tongues when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just a heavenly language, or sometimes it was a language that other people could understand from another nation. Just spoke in, just spoke in, in languages, as it were. Some just started to prophesy. They knew God's word for other people. It was a courage that came upon them. I'm believing that God's going to do that even in this, this, this short time we have remaining. So shall we stand together? Maybe we could have the musicians ready just in case we've got time for a song. Well, let's just let's pray together, shall we? We don't need to fear, friends. We don't need to fear. Some of you, you might be fearful now. You might think... Um, What's going to happen if I kind of open my heart up to receiving from God now? He's got good things for you. He's a good God. So when we ask him for the Holy Spirit, he's going to, he's going to give us a good gift. I just believe God wants just to, to free some people from, from fear now. Maybe you want to just posture yourself in a way that says to God, I want to receive from you. It might be opening up your hands. It might be whatever you, you think is right. But let's just uh, ask God now. Father, we come before you and we say thank you for bringing us to life where we were dead in our sins. Thank you that you gave your Holy Spirit to bring about a new birth in our lives. Thank you for bringing us to life. Thank you that you don't leave us as orphans, but we have the Holy Spirit living within us. But Father, we also know that we need such power to be your witnesses, to be on mission for you. And so we ask you, Father, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Come now upon each and every man and woman and child here. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Come and minister to each one of us now. Father, would we know a boldness that will come 
that we would witness to what you've done in our lives. Would we see, Heavenly Father, signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit? Just as Jesus, you saw so many great miracles, would we see such great miracles that would point people to you? Father, I pray that in the next three, four, five months here in Colchester and through this church, that there would be great miracles. Come amongst us. Let us know a heart warming of your spirit now. Come and thrill our hearts. Come and remind people across this room now by your spirit that they are children of God. Come and cause joy to bubble up. Why don't you just say what you need to say to God, friends? The musicians will just start to play. We may have time to sing for a little while. But just say what you need to say to God. Say, come and fill me, Holy Spirit. Come and fill me. Come and transform my life. Maybe you know there's just been moments this week where your heart has gone in search for other things to satisfy it. Come back to the truth now. Receive the grace of God. Receive his love for you. Just, uh, just right now, where you are, just do business with God. He sees you, he hears you. He's got good things for you. Maybe you want to know this gift of tongues. You know, it's a beautiful thing to pray in the spirit to, in your personal life as you're walking with God, just to pray in your own language, but then to pray in tongues. It's a powerful gift. It's a beautiful gift. Maybe you just want to ask him, God, would you give me that? But you actually have to start to use your tongue then. <laughs> just like Peter had to step out onto the water before he knew he could do it. You've got to start to use your tongue. And start to speak out. It might feel quite strange at first. You might think, am I making this up? God will help you. So start speaking out to him where you are. He's here amongst us, friends. He's got good things for us. If you don't know this Jesus, if you're here today, if you don't know him to be your saviour, this is a moment. This is a moment for you, even as we're singing before we close. There's a moment for you here to do business with this God and say, God, please forgive me. Please come into my life. Please change me. Receive from him now as we sing. Over to you guys.